Today we're going to talk about generative patching with OpX4 on the Akai Force and MPC. And I'd mainly like to try to answer three questions. Uh, one, what is a generative patch? Two, why would you want to make a patch like this? And three, how would you go about making a patch like this on the OpX4? Hi, my name is Joe. Welcome to my channel and thanks for stopping by. So what is a generative patch? It's pretty easy. I would just describe it as a patch that plays itself and you don't have to really touch it or anything. You can let it run for several minutes or several hours. And ideally it just keeps morphing and evolving over time. And ideally it never comes up with the same sound twice. So why would you want to make a patch like this? Well, there's a few reasons. It's not going to spit out a top 40 hit for you for sure. Um, but they can be really useful for things like uh, film and video and maybe even video games. Um, they also make a really unique sample source that you can chop and you know flip into your other tracks and projects. And then the third reason that they can be really fun to just play with once you figure out how to make these things. You can make small adjustments and sometimes they turn into really fun surprises and happy accidents. They're actually kind of addictive. So, can the OpX4 on the Akai Force make a generative patch? Let's find out. Let's begin by loading an initialized patch, the factory init patch. Now, this patch is almost fully initialized. However, it does contain a lot of um, modulation assignments. So it'll start with a lot of these, you know, highlighted in purple. What I would strongly recommend you do is to go through and turn all of these off across all eight pages. First of all, we want full control over the modulations. And also, they're gonna cause you some confusion as you go through this patch when things aren't behaving as you would expect them to be. The OpX4, like many synths, is expecting some MIDI input in order for it to make a sound, unlike a modular synth. So we're gonna start by faking this out a little bit. You'll see here I've recorded a four bar clip and this clip just contains a single middle C note. It sounds like this. Not very exciting at this point, but it's a great starting point and this is going to allow us to not have to hold down any keys in order for this patch to make a sound. Next, let's take a look at the envelope page. The envelopes are really one of the keys to making these generative patches work. I've made some adjustments to envelope one. I've turned decay one to about 300 milliseconds and decay two to about 600 milliseconds. I've turned the sustain all the way to 0%. I've turned the release down as far as it can go. I've switched the envelope from ADSR, DADSR mode into loop mode. And I've turned the tempo sync off. I've also set decay level one to be at 0%. So now we get a repeating envelope that is not tempo synced and it sounds like this. You'll notice that decay one controls the length of this pluck. And decay two controls the spacing between the plucks. The other thing I'd like you to notice here is that these envelopes, the different segments, get their values at the time that that segment begins, and if we modulate them, they don't change again until that segment is finished. So for example, if I turn up Decay 2 to something fairly long, and then I adjust it to something very short while it's playing, it doesn't get that new value until the next time that envelope is triggered. So the first thing we want to do is modulate these decay times. For generative patches, we're going to really want to use a lot of randoms. And there are some randoms available within the LFOs. Here I've set LFO 1 to random 1 and LFO 2 to random 2. Random 1 is a stepped modulation, similar to what you would get from a sample and hold attached to a noise. LFO 2 is set to random 2, and that's more of a smooth random. It's kind of like a meandering control signal that doesn't change too much between each part. I've set the speed of both of these LFOs to 1 hertz for a going in point. Let's move over to the modulation matrix and take a look at modulation slot 1. Here I've set up the source to be LFO 1, which is our stepped random and I've set the target to be decay 2, 1. 
That's DK2 on our first envelope, and if you'll recall, that controls the spacing between the notes. Let's start the patch playing again, and we'll turn this modulation slot on. And you can hear that's varying the space between our plucks. In modulation slot 2, I've set that up to be LFO2 and the target to be DK11. You'll recall that the first DK parameter controls the length of our pluck. Let's turn this modulation slot on and listen to the result of that. You'll notice that we can see the source modulation being represented by the purplish pink bar in this top row and what it's doing to the target being represented in the second row. I've also set up a third modulation slot to control the pitch of operator 1. I've used LFO1, the stepped random, as the source, and for the target I've selected ratio 1. You can see here I've set the modulation to a very small amount because the pitch can vary very wildly. Also, I have all three of these modulation sources set to bipolar mode. That means that it will start with where the actual knob position is set at in the synth parameter and vary it in either direction from there. Let's turn on mod 3 and listen to what we have now. This patch is starting to take shape. Well, the sound of this sine wave is starting to get a little boring. There's obviously a ton of ways that we can change the timbre of a sound with OpX4, uh, not the least of which is FM modulation. However, in an effort to keep this video from becoming too long, we're not going to use too much of that. Here I've adjusted the format of operator 1. I'm not sure exactly what that does, but it definitely adds some harmonic content to it. Let's take a listen to what that sounds like. I've also increased the self-modulation, the feedback of operator 1, to just give it a bit more bite. Operator 1 is being routed through bus 1, which contains its own filter. Over here on the Filters tab, I've adjusted the cutoff, resonance, and drive a bit. Let's engage this by turning it to a low pass 4. One of the cool things about OpX4 is that it has a lot of different effects in its signal path. It's got three different buses, and each bus has its own insert effect. It's also got two global effects that apply to all of the buses. FX1 goes with bus 1, and here I've set up a multi-tap delay. I haven't really changed any of the parameters except for the mix, which I've turned down to about 10%. You'll notice that the mix has a purple ring around it. You can't really modulate a lot about these effects, but there is one parameter per effect that you can modulate, and it's the one with that purplish pink ring around it. In this case, it's mix. It's different for each effect. Let's see what this sounds like. Over here on the modulation tab, I've set up LFO2 to control that effect 1 mod, which is the mix of our multi-tap delay. You can see I've also chosen a shaper effect here. These shaper effects sort of alter the input signal of the control signal that's being fed into it. In this case, since we're sending in a random from LFO2, it doesn't really provide a specific shape. However, it does make it different than the other sources that are using LFO2. So you can see here on, for example, channel 2, 
if you watch how this is affecting the target, once I turn this one on, you'll see that it's affecting this target differently. So even though we're using the exact same random, we're using kind of an altered version of it, and that way these two modulation sources don't vary in the exact same way. Let's turn this on and let it adjust the mix of the multi-tap delay. At this point, I'd like to bring in a drone to give this first operator some kind of context to interact with. So I've turned up the volume of operator two in the mix and sent it through bus two. On the operator two tab, I've set its ratio down to 0.125, which gives it a very low pitch. I've also turned the pulse width up quite a bit this control changes that sine wave into a more squarish wave, and adjusting this control adjusts the pulse width. Let's hear what this sounds like in the mix. Right now it's a very steady tone. On the filter tab, let's change this to a low pass two. Remember this is going through bus two, which has attached a filter to. And let's just hear how that sounds. I've just did the cutoff and the resonance as well as the drive. Finally, to give it some interest, let's modulate that filter. We're now on page two of our modulation slots, and I've assigned LFO2, which is our smooth random, to cutoff two. Again, the type is set to bipolar. I've set it to about 30%. Let's listen to what it sounds like with that filter being modulated. Next, let's add some global effects. I've got two effects set up here, a reverb and an ensemble. The reverb is just to give everything some space. All of the operators and everything will go through this Hall reverb effect. I've adjusted the mix down to about 30%, the high cut up to about 122 hertz, and I've brought the time up quite a bit. Let's engage this and listen to what it sounds like. For the second effect, I've set up an ensemble. I don't think I changed any of the default parameters here, but all of the operators run through this effect, and it just kind of glues them together a little bit in my opinion. And also, since we're not doing that much to change the operators, we're not really using much FM here, this just adds a little bit more spectral interest. Here's what that sounds like. OpEx also has a sample layer, so let's use it. Here I've selected the sample breath blown bottle, and I've switched it to loop, and I've also changed the transpose amount down to minus 26 semitones. Over here in the submixer, I've temporarily turned off the other two operators uh, and sent the sample into bus three. Let's have a listen to what that sounds like. Let's bring back in our other operators. It's got kind of a neat rhythmic clanging. 
I've also set up modulation slot six. This one we're sourcing from LFO one, which is our stepped random. And we've got it set to sample transpose, which we would transpose it either direction, bipolar, a little bit. Let's turn that on and give a listen. Sample 3 is being sent to bus 3, which has its own independent effect. Here I've chosen the phaser effect to apply it to the sample. I've left all the settings at default. Let's just turn it on and see what this sounds like. Actually, I did turn the LFO wave up to about 27% to give it some variation. just because it's new and very cool. This isn't part of OpX4, but I did have to add Air Flavor Pro onto this track. I've created a little preset here called Rumble Home Diode. It's fairly subtle, but it just adds the diode distortion. And over here in vinyl, it adds a little bit of rumble and a little bit of hum. I'll turn this on so you can see what this does to the sound. So there's a generative patch on the OPEX-4. We've just barely scratched the surface. There's obviously a lot more to say, both about generative patches and the OPEX-4 sound. I'd like to leave you with a few more ideas about ways you can explore patches like this. So first off, we barely used the OPEX-4. We only used two of the four oscillators. We only used six of the 32 modulation slots. We only used two of the four envelopes. There's a lot left just in OPEX-4 to play with. Also, we only used a few modulation destinations, and there are a ton of them. And really, any of those modulation destinations can be very interesting in a generative patch like this. They're all game. So I would try any of them, and you know, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to kind of fiddle around and get it uh, sounding just like you hope it might, but a lot of times it's worth the effort. And if you found this video helpful in any way, I would really appreciate it if you would go ahead and hit the like button for me. That really helps with the YouTube algorithm to help get this out to other people that might want to see it. Thank you for that. Also, if you're on the Akai Force, don't forget that there are 16 more LFOs available to you on the envelope follower page of the macros. And all 16 of these LFOs can be set to the smooth or stepped random modulation that we used internally in the OPEX 4. Now, while you can't use these envelope follower LFOs directly in OPEX 4's modulation matrix, they can modulate the controls directly, including some of the parameters that you can't modulate in OPEX 4, like many of the FX parameters. 
Also, today we've only used one instance of Opex 4. You can run up to eight on these machines. Wow, that's a lot, right? Imagine what you could do. Well, I hope you've learned something today that will help you get a little bit more out of your Akai Force or your MPC using Opex 4. Until next time, I'll catch you later.